Good evening, St. Anthony New Brighton School District. Thank you for joining us for our town hall meeting this evening. We had an opportunity to partner with CTV after we received feedback from our parents that not everyone was able to access our town hall meeting last week. So I'm Wendy Webster. Um, I'm here with our superintendent, Dr. Renee Cornet. Carrie Page, principal of Wilsh Park Elementary is with us, as well as Amy Kajowski, principal at St. Anthony Middle School. Justin Sawyer will be joining us, principal of St. Anthony Village High School, and McGean Keynes, our special guest, epidemiologist, parent, and community member. All right, Renee, welcome. Well, thank you, Wendy, I appreciate that. Um, what we'll do here is we're gonna be putting up some, some slides that we can be, uh, I, I'm not going to read them to you, but we'll kind of go through them. What we have done is we have uh, taken all of our most frequently asked questions. So those questions that have been coming into us, um, as we can imagine, when you you, you take uh, 200 plus years of doing school and uh, and over a summer, you just we decide to kind of shift things around and make them different. Um, we're going to probably need some time to explain that. So hopefully we have addressed a lot of your questions in this. Uh, in this town hall type setting. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, taking the time out of their evening to spend some time here with us in the schools. And I know Wendy, our Director of Community Services and Communications, um, um, introduced everyone, but these are our panelists today. We have a little bit of a presentation, like I said, that have really been directed towards your questions. So as we keep going, um, our agenda for tonight is that I will spend some time uh, sharing those uh, that presentation and kind of sharing through the opportunities that we have had to um, listen to your questions and then be able to formulate a presentation that will address them. Carrie Page, our principal at the elementary school, will also spend some time kind of just going over a little bit of the details. Not 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 every student schedule, but a, a, a more 25 foot level of what it will it look like in the elementary school. And then Amy Kajowski will do the same in the middle school, and Justin Sawyer as well in the high school. At the very end, if if, if we have the time we're also going to be um, taking some questions so if you want us uh, along the way if you have a question email us at that communications at isd282.org we'll be uh, filtering those to make sure that we can address them or if we, they already are addressed in the thing and we'll at the end if we have time we're going to do our best to answer some of those questions so and this this presentation does not mean you 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 shouldn't email us or you shouldn't call us if you have additional questions this is just providing more detail but at any point we are always here to support you as you navigate these changing times. So again, uh, what we heard, and I think Wendy addressed this, we heard your feedback. So we first time doing our Zoom uh, town hall meeting, we did not know if uh, we, we had no idea people would wanna uh, attend. And uh, we knew that in case people wanted to attend, we wanted to provide three different opportunities. Well, we had overwhelming uh, want, uh, people wanting to attend those meetings and we, we weren't able to accommodate everyone. So we, we felt bad about that. We, we definitely wanna be in the forefront of the communications that we are having. So we partnered with CTV North Suburbs who have been awesome and they're hosting this for us and allowing us to put it out um, for many people to see and stream on um, different um, access points. So thank you CTV North Suburbs. We really appreciate that. So let's think through this. So you, uh, many of you have maybe seen something like this, or you, you've heard these terms. You've heard like distance learning or hybrid or modified hybrid, all these on-site learning. What does it look like? What does this mean? So I want to spend some time thinking as we flip to this next slide, like how did St. Anthony New Brighton schools decide that modifi modified hybrid was going to be ours? So when you, yeah, if you flip one more, like how did this become, and please understand, when I put a star there, I think we all would prefer to be in on-site learning, okay, in person. But we know with COVID, it's not always the opportunity. So the star is really just an indicator that this is where we're at. So when we're in this modified, and, I, and I'll probably say modified more often than anything, and that because that is the model um, that we have, um, dis, mm, the board has approved to start the school year. Um, but I want to take us back a little bit and said, how did we get there? And so if um, we think about this, so what are we in schools, right? So we're all in the business of teaching and learning, right? Kiddos come to us, we teach them and they learn. That is just the core of what we do. Well, over the summer, when uh, we left, I guess, for the school year, I don't know if many of us have left, but this concept of leaving, um, this the, the governor had given all school districts, they said, plan for, and they, at that point, they said three models. They said, plan for a hybrid model, which maybe 50% of your students would be coming into the building, 
plan for distance learning, and plan for in-person learning. And so what we did is we said we brought all of our teaching and learning thinking together. We, we called that our schedule committee. And we wanted to say that no matter the model, because at that point we didn't know was the governor going to call what model we were in. We didn't know if it was going to be um, the superintendents calling. We didn't have an idea at that point. They just know we just knew we had to be prepared. And so we said we want to make sure that learning is the standard, no matter what no matter the model, we can get learning happening with our students. So that's what the committee was, was, was challenged to do. So as we navigate through this, how did we do that? When we say schedule committee, teaching and learning, who makes up that committee? So if we flip that next slide, these are our stakeholders and our stakeholders are really our strategic directions. We are responsible and we are driven by our students, our staff and our um, community. We're in relationship with all three of those stakeholder groups. And so that was the group that made up that schedule committee. And again, their point was, we. if you flip to this next thing, what is St. Anthony about? St. Anthony learning and teaching is about rigor, relevance, and relationships. We call them the three R's. And what we said is we need to ensure that those three R's, that how we define effective instruction can be embedded no matter the model that is put upon us or that we have to do because of COVID. So that teaching and learning team and that schedule committee, they weren't necessarily talking too much about um, the, the HVAC system or um, plexiglass. They were talking about teaching and learning no matter the model. And that's really important because the other group that was happening is that we set aside another group and we said, okay, if safety is just like learning, we can't compromise on either of those two things. Safety has to be there and so does learning. So we had put this group together and we said, look, you're in charge of saying no matter the model that is asked to be implemented, again, maybe it was the governor calling it, maybe it was going to be the school board, maybe the superintendent, whatever the model, this group said, this is how we're going to do that safely. And they put together what we call this blueprint. I'm not sure why it was called blueprint, maybe because St. Anthony were blue, who knows, but we called it the restart blueprint. So how do we restart school in any model that's safe? And if we were to click on this and we're not going to do it, you could go to our website. You can just, you can see all of the safety measures that are put into place. And we always have this as a draft because you know what? The CDC, the Minnesota Department of Health, they're coming out all the time with new and better ways of handling COVID. So we wanna be responsive to all of those things. So this schedule or this logistics and operations team, they were in charge of making sure that no matter the model selected, they had a plan to do it safely. So the next step in this was the school board. When, when July 30th, when the governor came out and said, hey, I'm not gonna decide how school's gonna open. Actually, local school districts are gonna do that, i.e. the school board. And the school board had the right at the beginning to say, this is how we're going to open in the fall. And their question they had to say is, how do we open safely and provide high levels of learning? That's what the board had to make a decision on. So the board knows that we had a, a schedule committee put together that said, here's how we're going to do learning no matter the model. The board knows we had a logistics and operations team that says, no matter the model, we, this is the safety measures we're putting into place. What they wanted to know, what the school board wanted to know was what is COVID saying to do? What is COVID? And I'm using COVID as a character in this story because they are in many ways in charge of how we open or not open schools. So um, this is where, if we go to that next slide, this is when we start bringing in these experts. Look, I am, and, I, and I'll say it, and I know it sounds weird, but I'm an expert when it comes to teaching and learning. I am not an expert on how disease spreads. I'm not an expert on the, uh, the needs of uh, children as a pediatric um, doctor is. I'm not a psychologist. So I brought these people together and believe it or not, St. Anthony, although small, we are mighty. We have all of these people within our, our own small community that I could reach out to. One of them is on this call, actually her birthday today. McGean Keynes is an epidemiologist. This is what she does her entire life where I think about learning objectives and how to plan an effective lesson, she's thinking about uh, disease spread and numbers and statistics. So I brought together people and, and friends in our neighborhood around public health, around epidemiology, our physicians, as well as our pedi pediatric doctors and our psychologists, and I asked them, tell me everything you know. They weren't acting as um, people in their profession. They were telling me as knowledge 
owners of knowledge tell us how we should be thinking about COVID and how we should open. Because just to kind of give you an example, our epidemiologists are saying COVID spreads, it, we better be, we need to take it seriously. The spread of COVID is a serious thing. Then our pediatric doctors are saying kids should be in school. That sometimes that can be confusing. We have to kind of grab, we have to kind of grapple with those two things that are true. And so my job was to collect all of this data from all of these experts around the idea of COVID. And then my job was to bring that data to the school board. Now the school board in the next slide is grappling with, they know what the school board knows is that every model has been vetted through the teaching and learning. Every model has been vetted under, with an understanding of how do we do this safely. So they know those two things are in place. Now, are all the details figured out? No, absolutely not. But what has been figured out is the big, big priorities when it comes to learning and safety. And I presented that data that the, that the county was given, what the state was told, and they said, you know what? This is what your data says. I talk to my epidemiologist friends and they tell me, this is what your data is saying. Here's how to think about that. And really what came to be, as we flip to that next slide, is what is the safest with the highest um, ability to provide high levels of learning is this modified approach. And in many ways we say hybrid, but the idea is it's really more distance learning with some in-person learning. And that's the way it balances out. And so I want to do a summary. So I want to make sure we understand this. The first thing we tackled this summer was that, again, no matter the model, we were going to ensure teaching and learning could occur. And no matter the model, we were going to ensure as much safety pro protocols in place. Then once those things were in place and we received the data from the state and the interpretation of that data from our experts went to the board and proposed a modified approach and the board approved that. And this is where we are now. So if you flip to that slide again, it has a star on it. Again, it's not our most favorite everything. It just means this is what we got to. Now, the reason I bring this up and I talk about this process is that it's important to understand that it, throughout this whole, whole, this whole summer, we have been sending surveys to our families. We've been sending surveys to our staff. We've been sending surveys to our students. We have been collecting all this information. We were collecting that information for one reason, how do we do school, no matter the model, with high levels of learning? We weren't asking our community, how do you think we should open schools? Because that's, that's not for us to decide. COVID is making those decisions. We're allowing the interpretation of that data from COVID to do the safest way of opening. And I think sometimes when we um, sent out some of those surveys, it appeared as if we were asking parents, hey, here are these four ways of doing learning. What would you pick? And that wasn't the case. And sometimes even for our staff, we were saying, hey, we're thinking about all these different models. It wasn't like they were picking and then it was a democracy at that point. And, and the one that got the highest votes, that's what we were going to enter into. The science of COVID is what was gonna help us make those decisions. So I really wanted to make sure that we have a good clarity and understanding on that. Um, so if you were, for example, at this point to have a question, this would be where you would ask that question in the communications, uh, I think it's, I forget the, the thing, but it was on that first slide. Um, so what is this modified hybrid model? Why is it, what is this uniqueness? What, what is this? This is like a brand new term. Um, so what's interesting about it is, is that it is unique. And, and that's what makes it modified or uh, different. Um, in every district, you can't go to like Columbia Heights, who's in a similar model as ours. They, they, they have a different name for it, I think. But there is, the way they're doing it is very different than the way we're doing it. And that's because we have unique needs and, and, and um, ideas about how we want to go about doing that work. The key to modified, and this is the key to this, is that it's equitable. Well, sometimes we mix up that word equitable and equal or the same. Equitable doesn't mean the same. Equitable is saying students are getting what they need. The way we've been doing school for the last 200 years is every kid gets the same thing. That's that cooker cut, cookie cutter approach. Not saying it's bad. I think we could do more personalizing, but this idea is that that's not what equitable and a modified model is. 
Modified allows us to provide students with what they need based on their unique circumstances. This allows us to have way more flexibility in how we approach those learning needs. So as we think about that, what does that might look like? So let's look at this overview, right? In kindergarten for first grade, you know what? Those kiddos, they haven't been to school yet. Maybe they've been to preschool. That's not dismissing that. But they, they're, they go to school, many of them, to learn how to read. That's the first thing we do, letters, this whole concept. It's really hard to do distance learning with directions when kiddos aren't able to read yet. And so we said, that's a priority. Those students, K-1, need more in-person support than maybe our 11th graders who already hopefully have that, that idea and understanding of how to read to learn down. So we prioritized K-1 and we said, you know what? K-1, you're coming to school half a day for until we can't. And what's important about that is that we had to change structures and staffing to make sure that happened because we're going to do that in a pod-based way. So 2-5, this means most of the 2-5 students, they're in a distance learning model. For example, I have a, I have a, I have a kiddo in third grade and a, and a kiddo in fifth grade. We're doing distance learning. Now, if one of my ch ch um, children needed some special services, there was a chance that maybe they needed to go into in-person school. Childcare. Some of our families are tier one workers. Some of our families, they may not be tier one workers, but they are unable to work out of the home. Their, their job won't allow that. Those kids need something from us and we need to provide that in school. Again, in six through eight in our um, middle school, we are allowed in because they're so small and we'll talk about this, you know, grades, our middle school only has three grades. This is the smallest building we have in our district. We're able to see them on a rotating three week cycle. We can see all the kids, but some kids are gonna be able to come to school more days than just that three week rotation. Now our high school, high school is so dynamic. There's so many kids taking so many different classes. Some are taking classes that they're already starting school with PSEO. This, the, the variability in the schedule for our high schoolers make um, hybrid even, even or modified even harder. But we're still gonna honor and support those kiddos that need in-person support. So this is kind of this big, broad overview of what does modified look like. So let's go into this. As we go into that next thing, it says, many of our families said, well, like, why do certain schools or why do certain students have more in-person support? And I know that in-person is a hot commodity, especially when we haven't been in school since March 18th. And so this in-person seems to be like the apple we are trying to get. And, that's, and it is, we, we want that. But when we say, as we go back a couple slides, Wendy, when, when our families ask this, why do some certain schools and some students get more of that? It goes back to that uniqueness about the equitable approach. So let's think about that. Let's talk about the students. Again, we've, I've articulated some of this. On that next slide, we say there are some things that we as a school provide in many ways that are, that are required of us. Again, I say that like we have to do it. I don't feel that way. We get to do this, but it's also required. Our students who are experiencing homelessness, they need things from us that, that, we're, that they just can't get anywhere else. In addition, there are some of our students who are learning English not for their first language. Maybe it's their second, maybe it's their third, maybe it's even their fourth. And they were a requirement for us to give them that language acquisition, both academic and social. And so we need to see them to do that. In addition, we have some of our special ed students, our students who receive special ed services that have different needs that we need to provide in-person support for. In addition, there are other um, things that our students need that may not required. And if you go to that next slide, it talks more about the things that schools provide kiddos that they can't maybe get outside of the school. One of them being childcare. I talked about that. We have tier one workers, we also have families who, who cannot work inside the home. They, their work has to be outside. Our little ones can't be home alone. So childcare becomes a dependent need and we need to provide that. We also have students who need mental health support. They're getting that support in school. In addition, schools do more than just teach uh, writing, arithmetic and all that, you know, whether those are three R's or whatever. We also provide adaptive skills, group dynamics, peer relationships, 
how to play on the playground together. We do all those things. We need to also do that. And that's what uh, kiddos need from us. And we need to continue to do that for some of them. So that's why schools, when you ask what is different, well, some of our students have unique needs and we need to provide those. Now, how come the schools are different, right? Well, enrollment's different. We have, you know, differing number of students in each building. I was talking about the high school. You know what, and you're in sixth and seventh and eighth grade, pretty much all your classes are the same. That's a, there's a lack of variety in middle school when it comes, we have a few electives, but they're very small. In the high school though, the electives are so grand, the variability of what you could be taking. And so because of that, you can't offer the same in-person support like you may be able to at the middle school or the elementary school. In addition, there are students that need to graduate. Actually, all students need to graduate. Let me rephrase that. Some of them are in different places in their requirements. And so if there's a kiddo that needs X class, uh, and, and if they don't get that class, they can't graduate, we need to give them that class. In addition, physical space. The whole reason the modified approach works in a safe way is because we have built small learning cohorts. We call them pods or cohorts. And those cohorts are probably 15 or less students with one or two, potentially three teachers that are assigned to them. Well, that means in our normal system, students are in classes of 20 to 30, we need double the space. So that's not gonna work either. So sometimes school differences are just based on physical space. Teacher licensure, let me give you a perfect example. If you're a chemistry teacher, you're probably not licensed to teach kindergarten. So we just have differing licensures and we can't provide all the things that we need with, with the teachers that we have. So you have to make sure that those, those that have the license are in front of the kiddos. In addition, in-person staffing. There are some, you know, as there's many of us, just like with our families who chose distance learning, we have a lot of, we have not a lot, we have a few of our own staff members who are unable to come in person to do their work because of medical conditions and so forth. So we have to accommodate for that. So these are the reasons why there are so many differences. And I can't just say, this is what it looks like because it is in many ways, super unique to the situation. So I hope that that helped under, give you some understanding about why those things are different. So another question or a few questions that we often get. What is it going to look like? What, what are students doing in distance learning with in-person support? What does this look like? Like, I, I don't get it. Like, I understand in the old days, like, you know, last year, you'd get on a bus, you go to school, you sit in a desk, and that's the teacher, and you, everything seemed to be normal. It's just so hard to know what it looks like. And then, how much work are they going to have at home? What's the difference between these things? So I want to be able to, like, just at a broad overview, each of our schools will kind of dig into these a little bit more. But if I go to that next slide, we're going to talk about how with distance learning, and that's the base to all that we're doing, for our school, the base model is distance learning. Most of the work in the learning is gonna be done at home for all students. Now, some students, in addition to the distance learning that they have at home, will have support with their learning while both at home and while at school. And that's the difference. That's the kind of the nuanced difference between that. Again, everyone will be learning from home. Some students will get additional support with that learning and work while they're at school. So I wanted to make sure we had an understanding of that. So what are some, what are some of the information that will be coming your way? What are some of the things that you might be looking for in the next few weeks? And, and I say weeks, I should say week. Um, so if we go to that next slide, um, one of the things that I think, um, especially at the elementary level, the, the excitement that comes in early August when people get to find out who their teacher is as they run around the community to see who's in their class. Um, those are coming out. Teacher assignments will be coming out and those will be coming out probably around September 1st. Secondary schedules around that same time. Now, how you'll get those delivered, whether it be in an email or in a, uh, something delivered, who knows, but you'll get that information. In addition, you're gonna be getting some information from your schools about meals and nutrition. Meaning if I'm at home and I am not coming into the building, how can I access school lunch? In addition, when I'm at school, how, do my, how can I have, ensure that my child is getting breakfast and lunch? In addition, around September 3rd and 4th, you'll be receiving a direct phone message as well as an email 
for all students regarding transportation. Now, if you didn't sign up for transportation and you don't have, you won't be receiving that. But if you're somebody who utilizes the transportation, that will be something that will be coming your way. Also yesterday, you received some information about technology. As we move into a distance learning format, all of our students need to have access to that technology. You got yesterday you received the information about how you could go and pick up that information or that that technology that is needed. Now, at this time, we're going to spend it going through each of the schools and each of the principals will have an opportunity to kind of highlight what it is that they're doing and how they're going about um, providing that modified approach. So Carrie Page. Okay, I think I'm here now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, sorry about that. Um, thanks so much for having me here tonight to talk a little bit about Wilshire Park. Um, so this first slide just talks about the mission that we've had at Wilshire Park for a long time. Um, at Wilshire Park, we want our students to feel valued. Um, we want to try to provide some indiv individualized educational experiences, and we're really concerned with making strong partnerships with our students, um, parents, and families. And so when we are valuing our students and creating partnerships, um, we really want to think about the relationships we're creating. And we have spent a lot of time talking about how to create those relationships, both in person and through distance learning. And so I know we have some parents out there who are wondering how that's going to work, you know, through a computer. But our teachers have really been thinking a lot about this and they really have some creative ideas to keep kids connected and also to help the teacher become connected to the student. Um, but we are gonna need our families to help us a little bit more this school year with that. Um, as well as individualizing instruction, we really want to make sure the instruction that is both in person and at home is um, rigorous and relevant to the students because we really want to encourage that curiosity that they have for learning to continue. Um, we want to provide projects and extension activities and things for the kids to do at home. So that just gives you a little bit of really big picture about Wilshire Park, but we'll keep going here. And there's a few more slides to um, talk about more about our platform. So you'll see this a lot through this presentation, but we are all working through a distance learning platform. Um, what that means is all of the students in the building are receiving similar content. Um, so it, it I, I don't want to say it doesn't matter if you're in person or at home, it matters. It's just that it will be similar. So it's not like somebody is going to be missing out on the learning. Um, we also are inviting in some students. Um, Dr. Cornea already talked about our youngest learners and students with some special needs. Those students, um, if you are in grades two through five, you're actually going to be receiving that email really soon, either tomorrow or Monday. We're really hoping um, that will give you that classroom teacher placement. And it will also tell you if your child is going to be invited into school, if you would like them to be so. But we wish we could do it for everybody, um, but we are starting with our students that we think are in most need. Also, we are shortening that school day. I think that was mentioned. Um, and that shortened day gives our teachers the ability to teach both in person and in, in a distance learning model. So I think those um, pieces below kind of get at what I just said. Yep, and I think we can move on to the next slide. So a lot of questions about what will this schedule look like? So I've created this slide um, to talk about the in-person schedule. So if a child, one of our kindergarten or first grader or invited students are coming into the building from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, we will be offering breakfast, hopefully outside or in the classroom if the weather turns colder. Um, we'll have a morning meeting to connect the students and really focus on some social emotional learning because some of the students we're inviting in really have some high needs in that area. From nine until noon, we will have two big blocks of study. We'll have a language art, arts block with that integration of social studies at times and a math block with an integration of science at times. 
Within that time, we will be having some outdoor play. Um, the hard part is that it won't look like typical recess where the kids can pretty much go wherever they want on that big field. They will have to stay in groups and we have a pretty organized schedule to keep them in their pods. Um, and that's been a big question from families about how is that gonna look? Because it, that's one big thing that is going to look a little different. Um, from noon to 12, from noon to 1230, excuse me, there will be an offering of lunch outside or in the classroom again. And, and then at 1230, we'll be getting ready, ready to, for dismissal. Um, it, if children are interested in some distance learning activities, there will be some optional extension activities. However, their learning will be captured during that in-person time. So parents don't need to feel too nervous about um, what that afternoon looks like. Also on Wednesdays, there will be a check-in with the teacher that day. So um, everyone's probably like, what? what happens when they don't go in? Yes, there will be a time given from the teacher that um, children are asked to check in and there'll be some kind of activity. All right, so that's the in-person schedule. The next slide is gonna talk about the distance learning schedule. So because I'm not in your homes, I won't know exactly what's happening there, but um, this, is, this is a framework that you could use. Um, at, from, at 8.30, our lessons are going to be posted to the Seesaw platform or to the Google Classroom plas platform. Again, the students are going to see the same similar content, language arts with a social studies integration and math with a science integration. We, it's really hard to say how much time will be spent at home because every learner is very different. We're anticipating about three to four hours, but we would need to know if things are happening really quickly or things are taking a really long time because we then need to adjust for your child. We are also offering a helpline, a phone, or an email, um, and our teaching assistants are going to staff those helplines in the morning. So if a child's at home and they want some help or they want to talk to one of our staff, um, they, can, they can access us, and maybe that'll give our parents a break or two um, so that they can focus on their own work. So that's, that's how we're going to try to provide a little support. We wonder if we're going to be a little overwhelmed in the first week or two. So um, bear with us as we try to figure that out. And then at two o'clock, there will be a live check-in with the teacher. And um, some parents have asked, do we have to do that? You do not have to, but we encourage it because it will be a time that connections can be made. Um, review of lessons, there might be small groups, there might even be some individualized instruction. So um, that two o'clock time is gonna be a time that we're hoping we can connect the students who are learning from home. All right. And I think that's it for me. So um, again, thank you for letting me share a little bit. If you have more questions, you can reach out to me at any time. And I'm wondering- Amy? Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Kajowski. I'm the principal at St. Anthony Middle School. And I have been trying to get this information out on um, different social media outlets and certainly emails that come from Tracy Adams. So if you're not getting this information, if this is the first time you're seeing this information, please reach out to us. We want to make sure we have the right contact information for you. So. We started, uh, just like Renee and Carrie and others have alluded, we started planning for reopening in the fall right away in June. And from the start, our three priorities have been the three bullets on the screen now. Most importantly, what is safe and manageable in these COVID-19 times? So, um, the safety of our students, your children, and our staff is, is really at the forefront of our planning. And then the, the um, uh, just an, to be a school that remains committed to authentic learning in a caring environment, even when things get challenging during a pandemic, that that has been a priority to us. In some ways, because 
COVID has caused such a disruption, it has given us an opportunity to make important shifts that we might not have been able to do had we not been stopped cold in our tracks like we were last March. And then lastly, we ended the school year last year with a, the whole school, all students did a school-wide project. We called it our end of the year project. And we asked students to engage in a whole learning around what's the purpose of school? What, what, what's the goals of learning? How do you become a learner? And how would you redesign SAMS in a way to meet those goals? And with that feedback, in partnership or in tandem with all the feedback we've gotten in the past few years, we came down to some really clear goals, like how do we lift student voice? How do we make connections to the real world with our learning? And how do we provide opportunities for our students and staff to really deepen their relationships? I will say that second bullet um, with some of the with some of the headlines and some of the context that our community is sitting in right now, that second bullet feels more important than ever. I know our students um, have a lot of curiosity and a lot of questions, and they want places to do deeper learning around real world topics. So. The, all of that said, we came up with a plan, um, as Renee said, coming out of the schedule committee where teachers and parents and staff members and students got together and said, we need to have a model that can be really fluid. And so St. Anthony Middle School, just like Wilshire Park in the high school, has a model that's based on distant, a distance learning platform. So even if we are in a full hybrid or modified hybrid, we're gonna be operating with a distance learning platform as our foundation. Um, right now, as, as Dr. Crane pointed out, we are in a modified hybrid. And so that means students will be coming into school, but um, only once every three weeks so that we can keep our numbers in school small and we rotate providing that there's a, there's a built-in two-week quarantine um, when the groups of students come back. Because of the information we learned from local epidemiologists and um, MDH guidelines, we know that those pods are really important. So the difference between our modified hybrid and a full hybrid is that the teachers and the students will stick together for the two days that they're together. Where in a more full hybrid, we, will, we would move the teachers so that the students could see each of their teachers at least once a week. Um, students are every, if you're a distance learning kid or you're a hybrid kid, every student will have a cohort. There'll be cohort A, and that means they come in on Mondays and Tuesdays, or they log into their core classes on Monday and Tuesday, or their cohort B which means they log into their core classes or they come into school on Thursdays and Fridays when it's their grade level. And every student will be a part of a team within that cohort, either the humanities team or the science seminar team, and those teams switch at semester time. The last bullet on this slide, um, much, um, much like the high school schedule, students will be in school participating from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and we will have a lunch break where students will be um, eating outside uh, around 12:15. So again, if you go back, if you go back to our priorities, using the feedback that we've gotten, knowing how the experience of distance learning went last spring, and trying our best to keep moving towards, a school committed to authentic learning in a caring environment, we have made some shifts. Typically, a middle school student in my school, in our school, has had seven classes, and we decide which classes they are. In this new updated plan for the challenge that we face this year, students will have five core classes, 
Humanities, which is an interdisciplinary course between language arts and social studies. Science seminar, which is an interdisciplinary course with science and another course, for example, in eighth grade, it's the ETEC, the design science, the STEM ETEC um, course. And in seventh grade, it is art. And then they also have math, reading and wellness. And wellness will be a combination of physical education and health with um, a significant aspect of social and emotional health. In the, in the past, in the electives, students got to pick up to two. Um, they, would, they could have two electives because some of the electives are only a semester long, but they only had one slot for electives. So in the past, if I was a band student, I didn't have the opportunity to participate in choir or, or facts, which is family and consumer science. So we're excited in our new model that on the opposite day of the cohort day, students will be able to take up to three electives. So a little bit of that depends on our staffing and our registration numbers, but we really hope to honor as much student interest as there is out there. Because we heard from our students that having to pick just one or two sometimes felt like that wasn't enough. So we're excited to switch up our model to offer a little bit more um, choice for students. And then I'm really proud of the core classes where we have these interdisciplinary opportunities and then a chance with math to move more fluidly among the levels. So I think there are some really positive changes that come with some of the shifts that we're making. I know that these are a lot of changes. And so I, I wanna make sure everyone knows there is um, in, in these challenging times, there is nothing more enjoyable for me right now than to talk about learning rigor, relevance, and some of the shifts we're making around those concepts to make sure that the learning opportunity at SAMS is rigorous and relevant and meaningful and maybe even transformational. I think we'll move it to Mr. Sawyer, our high school principal. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Sawyer, the high school principal. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, like Amy and Carrie said, I hope that you've been getting um, the information that we've been sending out and responses to questions. If you have not uh, been on our mailing list, please, please, please connect with Erica Sonnenberg in our office. To make sure we get you on our on our mailing list. Uh, you can also sign up for announcements off our school webpage because uh, we want to make sure you're getting all the communication as it comes out right away. Um, so similar challenges to the other buildings. How do we match up uh, what is safest for students and staff with what is best for learning with students and staff and also be in a system where we are able to move between models if needed, uh, if numbers and trends change uh, without us having to, you know, totally throw out what we're doing and start something new. We want to be able to move very quickly. So uh, the distance learning platform is what, you know, all the groups landed on and that's going to be the best way for all of our students to get uh, the same curriculum, the same content, the same um, opportunities um, that teachers will be posting. We'll use Google Classroom format, similar to what we did um, last year. Now, of course, we are going to be better at technology. We're going to be uh, better at embedding um, synchronous learning uh, within what we're doing, uh, where students will be able to tune in to, to live sessions or be able to view, view them later in a, a time that's better for them. Um, some people have asked about, you know, why we're not doing a fully synchronous day where students have to log in for a certain hour of time to meet with the teacher every day. And, and what we found is that was really hard for some students and for some families um, to, to make work. Either they had family responsibilities to take care of younger kids, uh, internet limitations, uh, sleep patterns, jobs, a variety of things that made it really hard for those synchronous um, things to be a, a required in a full day commitment. So our teachers will be offering some of those, but we'll also have alternate activities for those who choose to you know, do, their, do their learning at a different time of day. Um, last year we found that uh, it was a little bit tedious to have students do uh, an attendance check-in for all of their courses. Uh, so we're moving to a once a day 
uh, attendance check-in and we're also giving a greater flexibility of when that attendance needs to be taken. Uh, last year we had to, we said students had to have it done by two o'clock. Uh, we're now moving that to 11.59 p.m. in case someone is, you know, finds themselves working in the morning and wanting to do school work in the afternoon, they can sign in whenever works best for them. Although we are changing the number of courses that kids are taking at a time, um, just down to, to three or four classes at a time, uh, we're going to maintain all of our same graduation requirements. Some of those are uh, state requirements um, that we need to make sure that we follow, that we need to provide for all students to provide them uh, with, with those basics for a diploma, as well as some of local control things as, as well. But we'll still maintain uh, same number of courses per year, same number of credits per year. It's just going to be that those courses will be offered with fewer credits at a time, and it'll be more uh, similar to what's referred to as a block model, where they will do more of a course in a shorter period of time so they can go into a greater depth uh, with the learning and spend more time on that and less time trying to keep track and organize six or seven things at, at one time. Similar to what uh, Carrie talked about at Wilshire Park, um, we looked for um, opportunities to bring in students we found really needed that extra support, either school dependent or school required needs. Um, students who have been identified either um, language learners or students receiving special education services or students who struggled with distance learning last spring or students with some social um, challenges that need that social interaction and support from the teacher and from their peers. Um, so we're inviting in some of those students. Um, they'll be in, in cohorts, small groups uh, of about 12, and they'll meet either one or two days a week, um, depending on the student. We did send out those invitations yesterday, so families should have been receiving them um, today uh, with days and times and room numbers and all of that stuff. So students will be placed with grade levels, uh, and then we'll have teachers that are coming in and working with, um, with those small groups. And part of what Renee talked about earlier is there's a lot of variability in the courses that students are taking um, within high school. So rotating a couple or two or three teachers through a cohort of students allows them to maybe get help from a math teacher, social studies teacher, and an English teacher all within the, the same day when they're here. Uh, and they can get um, help with the work from that day or the work from the previous days and really find that extra support. Now in those cohorts, they'll also spend some time socializing a little bit. We've, we've had some time uh, away from our peers uh, and away from our teachers and spending time uh, just together and building relationships is gonna be an important part of what we do on a daily level as well. As Amy mentioned, we'll run the same time levels uh, uh, for high school, middle school, and that's a, a 10 o'clock to two o'clock timeline. Um, students who are learning from home, and this will be the majority of our students are, are going to be learning from home. And, and um, so we really have to prioritize um, preparing really excellent content to go out to the students that are, that are at home. So we're providing staff with the time to do that, the time to provide um, great content, the time to be available to provide support, whether it is via email or via, via Google Hangout or small group collaboration sessions, um, providing time to do that. Uh, those students who are learning at home are not tied to that 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock timeline. Um, so we found in the spring many students' sleep schedules changed a little bit, and getting up by 10 o'clock wasn't always happening, uh, and, and that's okay. Um, in this model, it gives them the flexibility to do their work in the time that feels better for them. Uh, we will have stuff available by 8 a.m., so if you're in, you have a kid who is an early riser, they can get up and get their work done early um, and get to it. Um, like I said earlier, there will be times where there are opportunities to tune into a live session and times where it is, you know, a recorded session or, or a reading or something else um, so that they can, they can do it kind of on their own time. Uh, another question that's kind of come up a lot is how much time will be needed um, each day for the learning? Uh, and that will really depend on the student. And, and the older that they get, um, the classes tend to take a little bit more time to do. So when we think about our ninth graders, uh, we're, we want to average about 60 minutes per day per class, um, and they'll have three to four classes per day. So we're looking at roughly four, four hours a day, uh, a little more, a little less, depending on the day, depending on the student. Uh, as we get a, li a little bit farther, our 10th through 12th graders, we're looking at 
more like 90 minutes per day per class. And the majority of our 10th through 12th graders will have three classes at a time. So again, we're looking at that three to four hour range, closer to the four hour range. And then students who are taking our uh, AP, the advanced placement classes and the college and schools classes, those classes will require more work um, and more time um, at about 120 minutes per day per class. So depending on the student, depending on the grade level and the courses they're taking, the amount of time spent per day will, will vary. Um, and that's kind of typical of how things would work, whether we are in person or learning um, through a distance learning uh, platform as well. I guess that's all I have for right now. Thank you. Um, as you can see, our principals have been uh, working pretty diligently with some uh, staff members to uh, go from, uh, I think it was two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, knowing what the, the plan would be for September 8th and being able to schedule and, and plan for this. So we've, we so appreciate everyone's understanding as we navigate these changes. Just a, re, just a reminder, um, you will be getting information. You're gonna be getting information at the elementary level about who the each of your, your children's uh, teacher will be, the secondary schedules, what classes there are available. You're gonna be getting, again, additional information about uh, meals, even if you're doing uh, distance learning and you're not coming into the building, having access to those opportunities for breakfast and lunch, as well as in the building, access to breakfast and lunch. Um, just a heads up, uh, in, the, in, in years past, if you're a kinder family, this may not mean much to you, but for the rest of uh, the, our parents, we have been using Infinite Campus for a long time. We're moving to a, a system called Skyward. It's just a different access point to the, for a lot of the same information, but a little bit more uh, one-stop shopping. So you'll be able to do a lot more within that student your, uh, on your side of the parent portal to do things like uh, re refilling your lunch account and things like that. Remember, if you are gonna be accessing transportation and many of you have been giving us that information, um, you'll be receiving direct information about your the routes and times uh, roughly around September 3rd or 4th. Uh, yesterday, you received the information about uh, our one-to-one -one initiative around uh, making sure that all of our kiddos have the technology they need to ensure success from that distance learning model. Um, as a reminder, I, uh, in the midst of COVID, there have been uh, lots of different um, funding sources that the federal government as well as the state government has, has realized are needed for schools to, to change their models and to ensure that they have the staffing as well as the um, technology that they need to operate. And so there are three different funding sources that have come through. It's called the ESSER, the GERS, and the CRF, right? So uh, you're, there's a lot of letters. Uh, I promise, even though I'm a teacher, there will be no quiz on that. But there are these three funding sources and we're using a lot of those funding sources to help um, ensure that all of our students have the technology that they need. We wouldn't would have been able to do that. We've been thinking about going one to one, but that does definitely requires a financial commitment and that um, using this, the, these funding sources, we've been able to do that. Um, so we're super excited to be able to start a new journey together. Uh, I know that a few questions have been coming in, but not, but not many, but now's the time to shine. If you have a question, uh, we would love to address them and make sure that you're feeling um, good uh, as good as one can be during a global pandemic as we look to open schools in our system. So one of the questions, and I'm going to, uh, I received it, was uh, to our technology director, who's also our uh, special education director, as well as our district assessment coordinator. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Hope to address the following question. It says here, my son will be receiving his Chromebook which is amazing. Now will insurance or safety plans such, in, such um, as in case technology gets damaged be economically friendly, such as affordable? Is there more info on this in the different rates? Hope, could you answer that question for us? Yeah, definitely. Um, we are excited, as Renee said, to be giving out technology to all of our students. And so next week um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we'll be having that device deployment um, out of the middle school, high school, door 16. Um, in regards to the insurance, yes, we do have a fam an option for families to purchase insurance on these devices. Um, the information about the insurance plan is located in our handbook, which is on our website on our technology page. So um, the rates are affordable. Um, I uh, feel like it's around $30 for the iPad and like 28 or $29 for a Chromebook for a year um, and does cover 
quite a bit, and all of that is summar summarized in the handbook. Uh, when you pick up your device, we will have a, another handout to give you that has um, more information about that warranty and what that process looks like. But the um, summary information is in the handbook on the website. Thank you, Hope. Uh, with a few more questions coming in. Also, a tip. Uh, I appreciate it. Secretary at the middle school, Tracy Adams, who gave me a little tip on my, uh, my system here. Um, when you are receiving that information, the email about transportation, please note that it will come in and will say, let me make sure I have it right, transportation at ISD 282. So look for that um, coming in on your email. Um, so additional questions. Miss Page, I sent you a question. I don't know if you were able to receive that. Let me know if you are ready to answer that question. Miss Page, are you around? I am. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure, I send it to you in a text. So why don't you look oh. at that and then I will address, I'll answer that question. We can answer that question in a little bit. Um, okay, sounds good. The next question is, there is a, a parent who would like to know, hey, do we need to buy school supplies? Like, you know, what's going on here? What, you know, how many glue sticks do I need this year? Right? I mean, I have, I think about 48 glue sticks still. So, um, yes, here's why. Kids love them right? They love school supplies. <laughs> and there, is there anything uh, better than new markers, crayons, and colored pencils? I know that each school, and they can address this, have um, put out a, a few things that would be requested. And I believe it's uh, uh, on the web page. I think you can look and click. I know that for my family, we, we did purchase some additional school supplies. Now, only, only purchase those things if you need them, um, but there will be at-home activities that are not always tied to an a electronic device. So um, I would get them. Do you need them? Not need, potentially, but yes, it would be helpful as we navigate into the school year. Um, so, uh, Carrie, are you ready? I'm going to read the question, and then we'll see how it goes. Um, I understand this parent, right? It says, this parent is upset. They don't understand why the 2 p.m. teacher check-in like my kid's gonna be up at 7 a.m. By the way, I have a 6 a.m. guy. He loves to get up at 6. No matter when I put him to bed, he's up at 6 a.m. So I, I'm, I, I can empathize with this parent. That's seven hours before the teacher will even say hello. My child's in second grade. How do we navigate this? So Ms. Page, can you help address that one? Yes, I can. You know, this is a question that we have thought a lot about because we know the two o'clock time is later in the day for a lot of our kids and they've been up for a long time. Um, we, we looked at our schedule, we tried to rework our schedule a couple different ways. It is difficult um, because the teacher is now doing two things. They're teaching students in person and they're teaching students at home. So some of those students have to get the contact in the afternoon. Some of those students have to get the contact in the morning. But what I want to tell um, this parent, and I think I did respond to you, but I think it was just right before this meeting. So I apologize if you haven't gotten it, um, the email yet. But I, I want to reassure this parent and others who have this concern that we are talking about um, trying to do some live teaching in the morning while the students are in person. Um, I will be honest, we haven't quite figured out how to pull it off yet. Um, we want to be successful at all we do. Um, and so we just weren't quite ready to say, yep, we're gonna do that for sure. But please know, um, we listen. We listen to our families. We listen to your concerns. We try to um, we try to do the best we can to meet all of those needs. And so we're gonna try to see what we can do to connect kids in the morning that are at home. For right now though, please try to do the 2 p.m. Um, thing if you can and um, we just hope that we can make connections that way for the time being and we'll we'll see what we can do down the road so thanks for understanding i know it's probably not the answer you want but thank you for understanding that we're trying to think about that situation well thank you and please continue to, to send in those questions if you have them what i would uh, like to talk about or this next question it says one if not only my kid but as i as a parent right this is a great question become completely overwhelmed with distance learning. And we saw this a little bit last spring, right? Totally get it. Here, here's what we, this is what we can share and we can promise in, in regards to this. We, in that modified approach, when we start out, we're ensuring that those students who we know right now 
or in need of something that we can help provide when it comes to school. As we're going along, and if we're seeing there's some students who are just not maybe um, making that connection at 2 p.m., they're not maybe uh, feeling the ability to navigate that distance learning, those are the times when we can reassess and say, you know what, I think we might need to pull that kid in for some in-person support. And so that's always out there and open as a possibility based on where that child's needs are sitting. And so we wanna be able to, again, it's unique, it's about equitable, how do we make sure that that happens? Um, so that's one, and as parents, as a parent myself, I, I hear you, these are the most difficult, not only am I a parent, like I've been trained as a teacher, like you'd think I could do this better, right? I could handle this. It's really hard. I don't want to uh, sugarcoat it and say, oh, it's going to be great. It's hard. Um, here's what we always say in school, uh, and uh, especially in the littles, uh, read. Uh, reading, if, if, if the kiddo doesn't want to get on and, and do those online lessons and the seesaw is not working, there is absolutely everything wonderful about reading. And if you need help navigating what are those developmentally appropriate level readers that your child may need, we'll get those for you. But if anything, ask your child to read. That is always the best solution when things are tough. So a couple more questions are coming in. Here's one, how do I get a hotspot? I don't have Wi-Fi at home. Hope, would you like to share about our, our hotspot program? Yes, so we do have hotspots available for families who um, do not have access to internet or don't have access to um, reliable internet. So we would ask um, that you email, and I'm going to get the email correct for you, email helpdesk at isd282.org um, and, and ask more information about that hotspot. And again, that uh, link is on our website, but it is helpdesk at isd282.org. Some additional questions coming through. I, I also think this is a really solid question and, and maybe as teachers, we may understand this a little bit better. And so when we communicate, um, it's hard sometimes because we're, we're always thinking about teaching and learning. And, we, and, and so I think this question is a great example of that. So the question is, it says here, how will the distance learning students know how to do the lessons without being taught the material? So like, how can you do the work without first learning? And so, um, here's how I'm going to answer this. So stay with me. Okay. I'm going to go really teacher nerdy on you on this. Okay. So just bear with me. Learning, we have a, um, because we've all, many of us, most all of us have been to school. And no matter where we were in this country of America, when we went to school, it looked really similar. And, 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 I, and uh, we refer to that as the grammar of school. So the idea is, is you walk in from the bus or your parents drop you off in the loop. You walk in, you have a backpack on, you may have a locker or a cubby. You put those materials in and the idea is you go to your desk. You have all your materials at your desk. More often than not, you sit in a row or you might sit in some pods. And then the teacher stands up in front and in many ways just gives the information or, or what we would uh, synonymous with teach the information to the children, the children receive that information, and then they do an activity that shows that they've learned it from the teacher. So this is what is the perception of what teaching is. As teachers, we know that that's not exactly how it works. Kiddos don't need tons of prior information to do the work. Let me give you an example. Watch your child play a video game. Before they got to the video game, before they put their thumbs on those devices, no one gave them a quiz on what the buttons mean. The B button means jump, the, the side button means up, and the Mario unit, when it has a feather on its head, it, they don't take a test and then play the game. They play the game and then they learn while they're playing. And that's how learning works. Teachers do not need to give them that information for them to acquire the information. We must facilitate their learning along the way. And I know that is super hard to understand and grasp, hence why we're bringing our kinders and first graders in, because reading is a, uh, first you learn how to read, and then reading is how you learn. And so we get that. But reading, 
that's how we access this information. And kiddos, they can grasp with new information as long as we structure that grasping of new information and allowing them to, to manipulate and make mistakes along the way. And so we don't see that. That's why sometimes families are really interested in that synchronized learning because they're like, the teacher must give the information to the child. We don't always see it that way. Sometimes that's important to do it that way. But the most, most of the time, again, watch your child play a video game. Never did they take a test beforehand to learn how to play the game. Many of them didn't even read the directions. They got in there and they learned it. So think about that as you're navigating what does distance learning look like? I think I'm getting more questions in, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, I'm also getting some uh, uh, questions from uh, some silly questions. So thank you to all those of uh, my friends out there that are sending me some questions that I think are silly. I like that, something about uh, dissection of some potentially pig dissection. So thank you for that. Okay, will student who is in the building get breakfast and lunch? Will I have to make my students lunch for them to bring to school? Good question. So um, if your child would like breakfast and lunch, your child can have breakfast and lunch at school, or you can bring your lunch, that they can bring their lunch to school. Both ways are uh, totally appropriate and allowed. So just using your, the way you would normally go about doing school is the same way that you can go doing, about doing that when in-person is happening. I hope I answered that question appropriately. Um, what if we can't pick up the computers at the three times next week? We'll figure that out. Hope is there a, a makeup day, but I know that we're not gonna be like, well, you missed it, you're out. We're gonna get you the material. I just don't know if there's a scheduled time for that. Uh, we, uh, we don't have a scheduled uh, official date, but we have been scheduling some individual ones that can't make it on those days. The other thing that you can do is um, you can go onto our website again and print out the permission form, have it all filled out and send it with a neighbor or send it with a friend or a relative and they can come and pick up that device for you as long as they have that permission form that is filled out for your child. This is a, I have a new, another question coming in. This is a great one and one that we often hear even from our staff because you know what? Um, when I, when we navigate the, the, the same questions with our staff, the, the, I want to put it out there. Like the idea of uh, COVID the idea that uh, we're going to come back to school and this idea that uh, spreading of COVID and we're supposed to be safe, that is a, such a real uh, sphere. As you can see around the nation, along even within the metro, so many of our, our educators are saying, we're scared. We don't know how to do this. And all I can say is, I hear you, right? The, I, you know, I'm scared too. Every, everyone has that bit of fear. It's, it's not something to play around with. And so a lot of times we get questions like this, even from our in, within internally and in, with our with our teachers and our and our and our staff here, uh, as well as some families. And that question is, is what do we do? What do we do when 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 students are in the building and they're not wearing their masks or they're not staying socially distanced? And you know what? We are we are fully expecting to have an, to have to navigate those concerns. And as we navigate with kiddos, um, they don't always. I don't know about how you how it is with your family, but sometimes with mine, they don't always listen. And in a, in a, in a school building, that's the same way. But as teachers and staff, we're used to that. We're used to helping students um, navigate really good decisions and behaviors. And so we are going to be doing as much as we can to ensure that, but also not make it punitive, right? So the last thing we want to do is is shame a child or yell at a child or isolate a child because they're not necessarily doing um, what they're supposed to be doing. It's about learning. So we're gonna meet them where they're at and we're gonna make sure they're safe. But the, the, the biggest concern we're gonna say, or the reason we're gonna say that this is important is because it's about the community. And this is something that I do really want to address with the community. If, if I have your attention, what I really wanna have you hear is that we are doing everything we can, everything within our power to create a learning model that is that mitigates the risks of spreading COVID and for people to getting sick. And um, it takes a lot for our teachers and our educators to come back into this building knowing how scary that is. And although we can say, oh, kids don't spread it, whatever, we're not gonna have that conversation. The conversation is, is that we are trying to build a safe learning environment so that those, the kids that really need this can get what they need. 
My, my hope for our families is when we start this and when we do this is that we are building pods. We are building pods of learners. If we want to continue to do in-person learning as much as we can, then when we're away from school, do our best to stay home and to, to limit our exposure into the community because that, all the exposures that we have outside of school, when that child comes back in, they're part of that pod. And so we want to limit exposure. So that's my ask. It's a big ask and I'm asking. I said it to our students who were starting athletics and activities this fall. I said, we want our students. It is, kiddos depend on us for that outlet for sports and activities. And we, we are going to create a COVID uh, safe location for them to do those things. But don't drive home together. Do your best to socially distance, even when you're not. <laughs> My epidemiologist friend is very happy with what I'm saying. Stay home, stay isolated so that we can continue doing this in-person work. McGee, do you agree? Is this the a right approach? Yeah, I would absolutely say that, um, you know, you have a dream team who's supporting you here in this community. There's Hennepin County, there's the state, you have emergency preparedness, you have public health, you have epidemia. All these people are giving their full attention to the wellness and we need the community's partnership. That's really the part that that we can't do without the community partnering on those practices and also on not stigmatizing those who may contract the infection. It's, it's an insidious disease. We can't, even if we do everything we're asked, sometimes it still sneaks in. So I am so supportive and happy with that message of both Let's keep working together, supporting each other, just like we would if we had cancer, a new baby, depression, a broken foot. Like let's let's do the part that the village does so well. And the more that we can stay on top of those steps, the the more we can offer our kids. Thank you, McGee. I, my public health announcement, right? I appreciate that. So another question coming in. Are the kids, and these are students at, at the elementary, who are enrolled in village kids, going to be doing school with the kids who are there because their parent is a tier one worker, or will there be two cohorts? So the, the students who are requiring village kids, um, or what we would say is childcare, are the same students that require tier one childcare. So, and tell me if I'm wrong, Carrie Page, we're seeing those as students who are, are needed in the system, and Wendy, they're, they may or may not be mixed, but they will always stay in a cohort, right? How do you, how, do, how does that, why don't you answer that one for me? Carrie, do you want me to start and you can jump in? Uh, and Brennan, one of the things I think COVID has really encouraged us to think differently. And one of the things I'm really proud about um, in Carrie and I's work together is we had to look at um, who are the kids that we know are going to need childcare and how do we um, safely uh, put them into grade level pods to uh, ensure the distance learning and the in-person support during distance learning. And then how might Village Kids staff um, support those classrooms and then stay with those grade level classrooms after school? So um, to the answer to the question is yes. Um, in one classroom, uh, you may have both Village Kids students um, and Tier 1 students in that same classroom. And um, at the same time, the Village Kids staff maybe providing some support in that classroom during the day. Uh, for example, when the teacher is uh, taking their lunch break or on prep. And then at the end of the day, the Village Cuts staff member will be with that pod um, for kids who need care between 3 and 5.30 p.m. Here's another question. Um, Okay, okay. It says, what is happening to my son's elective classes and how will they be able to build a decent college resume without extracurricular activities? Well, we are doing our best to continue those extracurricular activities. Our goal is not, as long as the Minnesota State High School League, as long as COVID numbers are staying the way they are, just like our fall sports were able to kick off this year. I know there were some that were delayed, but we are really working to ensure that our extracurricular activities or our, um, those things that are happening outside the school day are still able to happen because we know how important they are for the development of children. I, I know it's also important for their, their college resumes, but we see it as an important important life 
uh, opportunity for students to learn in, in, um, in uh, education-based activities. And so we find that to be a super important um, aspect. Mr. Sawyer, would you like to address some of that? Yeah, I mean, for, for example, right now, the theater department is exploring how they can put together a virtual or partially virtual or outdoor fall production. Um, some of our clubs are looking at how they can utilize uh, Wednesdays to have club meetings uh, virtually for the time being and how they can still put together some of the same experiences that they would do, just maybe framing them in a slightly different way or prepping for um, ways that we might do them when we get back together. It, uh, another question coming in around um, sports and someone said this might be a silly question. Not a silly question. We're teachers. There's never a silly question. Um, but will there be any sports this year? We, we sure hope so. We have a uh, Soccer, both boys and girls are practicing. We have um, swimming and diving, diving because we have a diving well now, um, and cross country. Am I missing any, Mr. Sawyer? Uh, girls tennis who Girls have tennis, two that's right. Already. So we have been practicing for over a week now. So yes, we are in and, and making that happen. Um, also, another, I, I answered a question about food service and I answered a question about, can I bring my own lunch? Um, if this, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say what I would love for you to do is all is to buy a lunch, and, and here's why: with all the changes that have occurred with distance learning and everything, our food service, uh, uh, who are some of my favorite people in the universe, our food service staff has had to actually be reduced because we haven't had as many students seeking breakfast and lunch. So, if your family is debating, hey, do I want to make a lunch or do I want to buy a lunch? We'd love it if you wanted to buy a lunch. So definitely, if you can, uh, eat lunch here at school or take the offer of us having it uh, in, uh, if you're doing distance learning, you can still receive lunch and breakfast. Okay, more questions coming in. Um, we start with distance. What sort of reassessment intervals will occur to assess whether more in-person school can happen? Like, do we need two weeks or four weeks of stable COVID, stable COVID trends? So yes, so every two weeks, and I, um, even though the, the, the statistics are a little bit delayed, I think today I received information from, the, it was August 17th data. And um, what it shows is the Hennepin County is that level I first look at. And at that level, we would see uh, where the county is at. And the state has given a pretty a specific first entry point to um, how you should be thinking about how school model, what school models should be implemented. We would definitely need to see a drop in that Hennepin County. We're over the 20s, which definitely sits us in that hybrid model. Um, so it would definitely need to be in a two week uh, frame, but also we know that data is delayed. So we would have to go that, uh, uh, reassess after that, meaning use that initial data set as well as our local data. And when I say local data, that means um, with uh, my epidemiologist friends teaching me uh, interpretation of data, um, using that model of 20 or uh, 50 uh, active cases to every 10,000 people, if we were to build that ratio back to what would that look like in our school, um, in any of our schools, what would be the, the positive case rate to actually have to shut down school because we have too many active cases. And that's what I would be looking at the experts in the areas of epidemiology and, and understanding what do these numbers mean, interpret this for me. So McGee, I'm going to ask this for you to help me with this one. There is no uh, tried and true uh, mechanism for what the number would be and when and how and what week interval because COVID has its own brain, right? Yeah, that's been a challenge throughout this pandemic. And uh, just the fact that we've been trying to learn as much as we can, as fast as we can over the last six months has been a professional challenge as well as how do we communicate that with the communities around us? Something that um, you and I have talked about and we've talked about with a lot of people are like, what would be surprising? What kinds of things would we kind of expect to see just to sort of get our arms around what we're talking about? Often when I talk to people, I talk about like the shape or the color because there's not necessarily a thin red line that when we come up to it, now we're safe. Um, it's all balancing different risks. I look at it from a frame of what can we reasonably intervene on? because as somebody who works in local public health, in addition to being a parent and a community member, I'm always thinking about like, what's in the zone where somebody could reasonably change the outcome here? And 
uh, happily in Minnesota. We've really stabilized in that zone, but we're not out of a very problematic space. Um, and so that's the kind of conversations that we have of, okay, we're, we're stable, but we're high. Well, the difference between 2021 and 19 is not huge. Thank you, McGean. Um, birthday, by the way, McGean's birthday today. Now the whole village knows. Um, so I'm looking through, scrolling through my questions here. Um, this one, I don't know. This one has like a, a this one sits a little different with me. Uh, and I actually like the question, but I'm not sure I like it. So it's, let me, let me explain. So, you know, I've been the superintendent for two full years. And I don't know if it seems like ages ago, but do you remember the polar vortex? Remember when we were so upset about how much snow and how many snow days? As my first year as superintendent, I think I called seven snow days. Little did we know that we would be uh, where we are at with COVID. And so this question says, will we get to enjoy snow days this year or will we do distance learning? I'm not sure. Like, I think at some point, if it was really bad, we would have to cancel in-person school. But because everything's on distance learning, we could still do distance learning. So that was, I got to have to think about that one. But that that's a, uh, I, I'm just going to think about the snow day question. How's that? Um, so this person um, asks about uh, our music program, choir and band. And here's the deal. We actually... Just today, an email came in about further guidance on how do we do choir and band as we, we talk about. I mean, uh, with COVID, those things don't always mix well. So are we going to have them and be offered with them? Well, we've made some a few edits. Uh, for example, we're going to uh, the high school because choir is definitely something that requires a lot of um, uh Yes, so we're going to move that at least a quarter two and see if we can um, allow that elective to be offered then. Um, and then might be just doing something more music based, not necessarily choir or singing based um, for band and choir. So more to come on that, but we're working hard to make sure that that happens. Um, someone, um, I there was a, so somebody is a little upset because they, they're upset about the idea of having sports right now. And they thought maybe when I addressed that question, I was talking about a different question. So I'm sorry, someone else asked a sports question. Um, this person is asking about non-sporting classes like French, please address this. Yep, we're still offering all the electives that we have had at the high school. They just may not be offered at the same time. Mr. Sawyer, do you want to address that? Again, all classes are being offered, right? Or majority of classes that have the enrollment. Yeah, we, uh, we did not cancel any of the classes that we were planning to, to hold this fall. So languages will obviously um, rely on some recording oneself and doing some, some Google Meets to do conversational speaking. Uh, but yeah, all of those things will happen. Uh, some of the challenges do come in when we talk about, I know uh, pig dissection was, was mentioned earlier and how we, some things like that we have to do through virtual labs or simulations at this point, um, you know, and we'll see how things progress through the year. So some things will be different as far as electives go, but we want to provide as uh, as close to a normal experience as we could with it, without being hands-on. Thank you. Um, it says here, can distance learners have access to mental health professionals through the district? Yes, we do um, uh, contract with school-based mental health with Lee Carlson, and I know even last year they, um, they provided tele- uh, uh, sessions. And so all you need to do is contact your um, counselor at your district or even your uh, principal. And, and Hope, would you have more to say on that? You kind of popped in. I think you want to say something. I, I just didn't know if you were going to ask me. Uh, yes, we do contract with Lee Carlson. They will be um, on site some days to meet with students um, if it's a, um, appropriate in a socially distanced manner, possibly outside in larger spaces. But they will also be offering telehealth as well. And so as, yeah, as Renee said, please contact your principal or the counselor in your building um, if you would like us to make a referral for that um, in school mental health. I think this is gonna be the last question and I think it's a good one. So we'll end on a uh, hopefully one that addresses some concerns that many have. So this one, this uh, person said, I like what I'm hearing thus far. What are the protocols for ensuring that COVID-19 contagious kid are not going to school? Will universal masking be required? What communications and mitigation steps can parents expect if a contagi contagious person has been in an ISD 282 facilities? So let me address some of this. This is great. 
um, we definitely have some protocols. And early in the presentation, we have a, a link to our blueprint, which kind of outlines all of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll address some of them. So the first and major protocol that we are, we are working on is um, in the modified concept is by building those pods. That we know is, um, to, uh, is the safest way to ensure and contain um, spread. So what that means is, is that if a student um, in a pod is contagious, we can shut down, or if they've been exposed, we can shut down that one pod without necessarily shutting down the whole school because we have kept these spaces separate and they do not interact. And so that's like one of the major reasons we went to that modified approach. The second thing is, is it is universal masking. Absolutely. Of course, there are some um, stipulations for students who have some special needs in regards to that and are, are super young learners in our preschool program potentially. But as a whole, yes, universal masking. Um, in addition, so what happens like if somebody's been in the building and it's been contagious, we have a um, a, a protocol for when a student who is experiencing symptoms, or if we know about them, we, we have an isolation area, we, we have a proper uh, cleaning protocol in regards to that. We also have cleaning protocols throughout the day to just mitigate some of that spread. What I've learned from our public health experts is that COVID, um, we, although we are gonna continue to do that cleaning, the best things for us to do are wash our hands, um, and COVID doesn't like to live too much on hard surfaces. So we are gonna continue to spray and use all the right protocols. In addition, we're gonna ask everybody to um, could have a, a screen before they come in. Uh, CDC does not recommend us taking temperatures. There's a lot of variation in that. What we're doing is we're requiring parents to do that at home. Um, and then again, if, if children um, uh, try to enter the building and they haven't had that screen, we have some protocols to ensure that we get that screen. So all staff and all students will be have a screening prior to. I'm um, not sure if I have answered all of that uh, adequately, but that, that uh, blueprint provides a lot of those safety protocols that are in place, even for how we're entering and exiting the building and what uh, doors are, are in and out. Um, I might have one answer to one more question. Um, someone, uh, oh, this got a little, this one, this last question kind of hit my heart a little bit. Someone uh, asked if I could include the fractions quote. Uh, uh, the key to that fractions quote is really that uh, kids will do even crazy and odd things like add fractions for people they love and trust. And what we're trying to do here in St. Anthony is to ensure that our students feel loved and that they feel that this is a safe place for them. Because when we can do that, uh, we really feel like they can do a lot of learning. So I'm going to end on that. I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. I'd like to um, also take some time to honor uh, uh, the work of our administrators and a lot of our teacher leaders who since March 18th um, haven't had a break and uh, they have been diligently working uh, to ensure that high levels of learning as well as um, ensuring the safety uh, and mitigating all of those um, safety protocols to ensure that uh, we can we can we can open safely and provide high levels of learning and it means a lot when you have such a committed a group of individuals who are willing to, um, in many ways, sacrifice their own uh, mental health, their own uh, physical health to ensure that those others are safe and taken care of. And so uh, I'd like to thank uh, that's the, the staff in St. Anthony for working diligently to do that. Um, I'd also like to, to encourage and thank our community to um, really do our best to stay home and uh, especially when school starts, so that we can do this as long as we can in a safe way. So we appreciate it. Thank you. CTV, thank you. We appreciate your partnership.